Hi guys. Very nice to see you, Steph and everybody. Thanks for tuning in. It's been a little while. We're uh, in 2023. Oh my goodness. <laughs> How did this happen? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, so yeah, we're we're gearing up to do some new fun things this year with Adored Beast Equine. Um, I've got a big uh, calendar laid out for um, lots of educational materials. Hopefully we're going to be doing some more lives, um, lots of like educational shorts, uh, videos. So if you guys have any topics that you would like to learn about, please let us know. Um, you can always contact us through questions at adoredbeast.com and talk to our wonderful representatives there and just let them know your feedback. What do you want to know? What do you want to learn? Um, I'm totally game for anything. There's so many topics that we could discuss. So um, today I wanted to talk about um, feet, which is a kind of uh, it's, it's its own world. <laughs> and, uh, all of you that have horses probably have a, either a normal farrier or a barefoot farrier or some kind of person that trims your horse's feet. And I'm sure you've heard lots of feedback from them about the quality of your horse's feet and, um, maybe suggestions for, uh, what, what can be done, uh, based on your horse's confirmation, your horse's workload, age, um, you know, all of these things are, um, are really important. So I thought I'd dedicate a, an hour to talking just about uh, hooves in general and what we can do to ensure that they are really super healthy because it's, um, everyone knows the old saying, uh, no horse, no hoof. So, or I mean, no hoof, no horse. <laughs> I'm dyslexic. So um, we're going to talk uh, firstly about uh, what the most common um, problems with hooves are. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, if you can see that, let me know stuff. Yep, looks good. Thank you. Um, all right, and I'll make it look prettier. There. there. Okay. Whoops. Sorry, guys. It's been a while since I've been on Zoom here. All right. Okay, so if you have a horse, they have four hooves. <laughs> so what are hooves? Uh, they're more than just feet. So that's something that is really important to understand about equine and also other uh, very heavy, large um, hooved animals. It, it, the hoof is actually a dynamic and flexible tissue. So it actually can conform to the ground um, as the horse is moving over different terrains. Um, it is largely made from keratin, which is a highly durable protein. So that's why, you know, uh, it's, it, it's okay for them to be running over rocks and, you know, hard surfaces, soft surfaces, all different types of surfaces and their feet don't feel sore, hopefully. <laughs> um, they're also shock absorbers. So when they're moving really quickly, if they're hitting really hard because they're very heavy animals, um, this is a really important aspect as well. Um, they also protect the joints and circulate the blood through the legs and even beyond. So uh, they, they, the amount of movement that your horse is getting um, it actually determines how healthy their circulatory system will be. Um, so hoof disorders are uh, from, a, from a study that was done in the Netherlands in, I believe, 2021, 85% um, of the horses that were studied in this, uh, in this group uh, had some sort of uh, disorder of the hoof. And so it seems to become becoming more common. And uh, so today we're going to look at some of those uh, disorders and what we can do to uh, prevent them and also help our horses if they have them. Uh, so chronic abscess is a really big one. Um, we'll talk about all the causes and 
solutions for these as well. Uh, thrash, cracks in the wall of the hoof, um, also chronic cracks, uh, you know, one here and there is sometimes not such a big deal depending on how big it is, but if there's chronic, uh, chronic cracks forming, um, that would be a hoof integrity issue. Uh, growth rings, bruising, navicular disease, and also white line disease. So these are all things that, that you know, as horse people, you've probably heard of them. Um, and probably had to deal with at least one or two of these in, in your time with horses. Oops, sorry guys. So risk factors for disease of the hoof uh, include obviously trimming and shoeing, um, the environment, how wet it is, how cold it is, how hot it is, how dry it is, um, the type of footing that your horse is living on, and also working on are all really important aspects. Um, confirmation is another one, depending on how, like what shape your horse's feet are, what shape their, their whole overall confirmation is, and then making sure that you have um, a farrier that's trimming and shoeing your horse for the confirmation so that they are actually balanced. Um, and then metabolic disease and metabolic health are really, really super important. We've all heard of laminitis, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, exercise, forms of exercise, types of exercise, and then also the footing that you're exercising your horses on. Um, and also gut health, which is the one that Steph was hoping that some of you would guess <laughs> um, as a kind of mystery, uh, sort of forgotten um, or newer information on uh, an aspect of, of horse health that can affect the hoof. So gut, the gut is a, a contributing factor to that. So we will talk about all of these. Um, so the first one that we'll talk about is thrush. This is a pretty common one actually where I live uh, because we have um, very wet, long, wet, rainy seasons here. And that makes for uh, very wet ground. And um, when horses feet get wet on a regular basis, it can cause many different issues. If their feet are getting soft from that, um, they're getting saturated with water. Uh, not only does it make the integrity of the hoof um, weaker, but it also, um, promotes anaerobic bacteria, which anaerobic bacteria are the type of bacteria that love low oxygenated places. So when um, this is happening in the foot, uh, if, if there's lots of wet ground, um, uh, little tiny pockets can form inside under, it's often seen around the frog. And you can see in this picture, this is really seriously scary. Um, long-term effects of, of a thrush infection where the frog is like very necrotic and very eaten away. Um, so you wanna try and get on top of this before it gets to this point, obviously. Uh, and you can usually tell uh, by smelling your horse's feet on a regular basis, picking your horse's feet out every day when it's wet um, is really important for not allowing all of that anaerobic buildup. Um, uh, discharge can usually be seen in, in a, uh, it's sort of a pussy and smelly discharge. Um, they can be more sensitive, uh, especially in hard ground. Um, and they can also have easy bleeding, um, bruising of their hoof and also even up into their legs. So you want to, you know, be really aware of what's going on in your horse's feet. I look at my horse's feet every single day. Um, to see what's going on in there. Just make sure everything's going okay. Um, all right, so cracked hooves is another one. There's many different ways that uh, cracks can form in the hooves, laterally, vertically, uh, heel cracks, quarter cracks, toe cracks. Uh, these are all things that can happen for a number of reasons. Um, if they're having chronic cracks in specific areas, uh, this is a multi-level uh, problem, which generally would be associated with um, 
you know, several things, often mineral imbalance, gut issues, uh, systemic inflammation, um, trimming or shoeing issues, and also if the hoof is congenitally defected, so uh, from birth. So those are all factors for that. Um, growth rings are uh, historically thought of as um, a sign that a horse has had a laminitic episode, and we'll talk about laminitis in a minute, uh, but it doesn't necessarily always mean that. So um, growth rings can, you don't want to see deep, heavy growth rings in your horse's feet because it's usually a sign that's of some sort of stress. Um, it's more common in seasonal uh, change periods where the circadian rhythm is changing, their um, hair coat is falling out and regrowing um, due to the light changes in the environment and that can affect their metabolism and, and can often cause these rings if there is a significant amount of stress going on. Um, it can be associated with laminitis, but it's not always so. Oh, I just have this very silly little thing popping up on my, <laughs> on my screen. Um, I hope you can't see it. No. Uh, uh, okay, good. <laughs> um, bruising and chronic abscess. Uh, probably, probably everyone's dealt with an abscess or two before. And um, uh, bruising is an issue that if it's happening on a regular basis, uh, it could be due to, uh, hoof integrity. So soft to the feet are too soft, um, wet conditions, chronic wet conditions in their paddock or in their field, um, which makes their feet soft, uh, trimming and chewing again. Um, sometimes, uh, that has to be adjusted to make sure that, um, that's not the issue. Confirmation again, and workload and also footing, uh, work footing and environmental footing. Um, and you can see this foot actually has bruising. I don't know if you can see my mouse, um, but it has bruising. And it also has this little area here and here, and also over here, you can see that these areas where most likely this is where abscesses have blown out of the hoof, this one in particular. Um, so uh, this horse has probably very sore and um, it's a pretty good example of, uh, you know, how, what can happen when the feet are too soft. Um, and navicular disease this is not a fun one. A lot of people get really upset when they get this diagnosis for their horse. Um, often happens in older horses, horses with uh, too, carrying too much weight, uh, confirmation issues, congenital issues, uh, can happen through injury and also circulatory disorders, which uh, leads into laminitis and also an inflammatory diet leading to inflammatory systemic inflammation in the body. Um, so the feet are connected to the whole entire horse and it's very important for them to have healthy feet. Uh, white line disease is another one, which is a separation between the uh, layers of the hoof wall. So you can see in this one, the, uh, the separation here. Um, so this can often happen from secondary bacterial infections, fungal infections, thrush, um, other types of uh, bacteria. Uh, it usually leads to a lot of pain and discomfort if it's going on for a long period of time. Um, and the problem isn't always, in, it hasn't been entirely figured out as to why horses get this particular problem and why each horse will get it to a varying degree. Um, but they do stipulate that it could be from confirmation, uh, wet and dry conditions, and also vascular disorders. So it's most likely linked to all of those things. <laughs> uh, and then laminitis is uh, kind of our, another, whoops, another scary one, um, which we have all heard of at least. Um, 
So inflammation and damage of the hoof tissue and the coffin bone. So this happens uh, due to uh, inflammation of the laminae, the tissue, which is a type of tissue in the leg and the hoof. Um, and it can lead to um, a separation uh, and uh, degradation of the entire hoof. And also it can dislodge the coffin bone from the hoof capsule. So it's, it, it can result in um, a horse needing to be euthanized. It's extremely painful and um, often uh, connected to metabolic health. So you see this a lot, it, a lot more in older horses, obese horses, horses with insulin resistance, um, those, those scenarios. And then uh, these are the risk factors for uh, the development of all of these. Um, and, and when I talk about these, it could be a number of these issues. It's usually not just one. There's usually several areas where a horse needs help um, in order to recover from any of these situations. So uh, trimming and shoeing is a huge one. Um, you have to have a farrier that is keeping your horse comfortable. Um, you also should be checking in if you're not sure about um, whether or not your horse's feet are balanced, especially on the fronts, which are usually the problem feet. <laughs> um, it's good to get a, a set of balance x-rays done, which can be done through your veterinarian very easily. Uh, a lot of people do this on um, pre-purchases for uh, vetting horses before they buy them uh, because it is such a big deal. So um, if you own a horse, uh, you know, every couple of years, um, I do every three years where we just take, or every two years, uh, where we took, take a look at the balance of the coffin bone inside the hoof. And uh, we make sure that the angles are correct and that the, the bones are sitting correctly and that the horse is actually comfortable with um, what we're doing. And then my veterinarian will send those to my farrier. My farrier will look at them and either change things or keep going. And generally we just keep going because my farrier is awesome. So, uh, and then lack of regular trimming is another one that, you know, it's really important to book your uh, trimming appointments or shoeing appointments ahead of time. So just make sure you get on a cycle. My horse is on a five week cycle. So we just book the next one. When we see our farrier, he just books us in for the next, the next five weeks. Um, so that's really important. So you don't forget to book it. You don't go too long without a trim. Um, this is also really important for uh, getting rid of any bacteria and um, debris uh, from the tissue that's just sitting there, especially when it's wet, um, you want to remove that tissue as often as you possibly can, especially if you have uh, a, an infection in there or anything like that. Um, also incorrect shoeing, like I said, it can be um, pretty devastating and, and awful and very painful for a horse. Uh, environment, so overly wet and dry conditions, can cause different types of problems. Um, generally in dry conditions, we see lots of cracking. Um, <clears throat> and then in overly wet conditions, lots of bacteria, lots of soft feet, et cetera. Um, extreme temperatures, uh, extreme types of footing, um, really hard footing, really coarse footing, footing that's too soft. Um, all of these things can, uh, it, you know, if a horse is only living and existing on one type of surface, it can really affect um, the circulation and the integrity of the feet. So it's really important to get them out on different types of footing, hard ground, soft ground, um, all uneven ground, all that kind of stuff, because um, that actually helps to train the feet to uh, become less, um, less uh, sensitive and um, also uh, helps with the expansion and contraction of the foot, circulation, all of those things. And, and the more circulation you have in the foot, uh, the more oxygen you have in the foot. And with those anaerobic bacteria, they don't like oxygen, that they, they do not thrive in oxygenated feet. So you wanna make sure that all of these pieces are in there so that um, your 
preventing and discouraging the growth of these, these kinds of bacteria. Um, diet is also part of the environment, and we'll talk more about that uh, in, in some later slides here. Um, exercise, lack of exercise, lack of movement, lack of circulation, like I said, that can be a huge issue in terms of um, the expansion and contraction, the integrity of the foot. Um, heavy exercise on hard, uneven surfaces, if you don't have the right shoes on or you don't have uh, a horse that can conformationally handle those things, or if you're just running your horses too hard, um, all of these things can, um, can affect the hoof. Uh, and then, like I said before, improper shoeing plus heavy work uh, can be kind of a recipe for a disaster. Um, nutritional status is another one. This is kind of what I specialize in. I have tons of clients that um, seek me out specifically because their horse's feet are um, not good, <laughs> to say it nicely. Uh, and uh, it usually does take a, a number of months, if not even a year, to, um, to get their feet looking the way that we want. Um, I have had cases where even the farrier has been um, accused of poor shoeing. And when I look at the foot, I, it's not what I see. Oftentimes it is actually because there is nothing to, <laughs> nothing to trim and nothing to shoe because the, the foot is so unhealthy that it's very difficult for a farrier to do good work if the foot is already unhealthy. So I always make sure that we do a, you know, a full overhaul, make sure that uh, there's no vitamin deficiencies, mineral deficiencies, protein deficiencies, um, metabolic health is really, really important. So um, horses are very starch and sugar sensitive. So we have to make sure that we're preventing uh, you know, future issues with metabolic disease. And the, the earlier you can do that, the more likely your horse is going to have a very uh, enjoyable senior life. So it's really important to, to make sure that you're paying attention to that. Um, exercise uh, in, in terms of like what, uh, what they're eating and how much exercise they're doing. So if they are not getting what they need to do the exercise that, they, um, that they're doing, uh, this can also cause nutritional deficiencies. And gut health can also cause nutritional deficiencies when the gut isn't working properly. There are lots of um, particularly vitamin deficiencies and also short chain fatty acid deficiencies, which can lead to systemic inflammation and um, uh, the inability of the horse to grow their feet properly. Uh, and then gut health, which is uh, this very mysterious one that no one really thinks about, <laughs> but uh, because uh, we're adored beast and that's all we're obsessed with gut health, we always talk about that. Um, so uh, the Inflamed gut equals inflamed tissues. It causes systemic inflammation. There's a million studies on, uh, you know, uh, dysbiosis and gut inflammation in humans, horses, dogs, cats. Um, IBS is a huge problem for all of these creatures. Um, and uh, gut health is, is definitely tied to environment and a lot of management techniques that we're using these days are not really helping our horses out. So um, usually, uh, you know, NSAID drugs such as Butte, uh, Prevacox, these types of drugs can, are proven to cause ulcers, which is a very end stage, terrible version of leaky gut disease, um, where there are actually holes in the gut lining, um, which can lead to a whole number of issues, including um, poor circulation uh, and poor feet. And then repeated antibiotics is another one that can really affect your horse's gut. Um, processed feed, uh, so I always focus on forage rather than feed, and we do have a, a blog about that. I don't know if you can find that one, Steph. Um, and uh, a lot of horses don't have access to dirt that is actually alive. 
So a lot of horses are living on ground that is, uh, let's say, sterile or promotes anaerobic bacteria. <laughs> so not only is that bad for their feet, but it's also bad for their gut because they're actually eating off of that ground most of the time. So uh, we're going to talk about how to remedy that if your horse doesn't have access to dirt um, or not enough access to dirt. Uh, there's some things that you can do there. Oops, made a boo-boo. Uh, yeah. You asked me to find a blog. Was it feed or feet? Sorry. Uh, feed, forage versus feed. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, I can totally look that, that up and add it. That, right? Uh, oh, gosh, you've written about all, just about every topic. I'm pretty sure we do. Whoops. I believe so. Right. Here's my silly mistake. Okay. Yes. Um, so we're going to talk about the solutions now, because that was depressing, right? <laughs> Um, so, uh, diet is usually where I focus. Um, I can often tell kind of what might be going on, uh, based on what the feet look like and, and probably what areas is the horse needs to have some input, um, uh, in the diet department. So, uh, mineral and vitamin deficiencies are just so rampant in horses because a lot of people are just feeding one type of hay and, um, you know, when you're feeding processed feed, yes, on the bag, it says that the nutrients and vitamins and minerals are in the bag, but it also contains a lot of really low, um, low quality ingredients that are often sugar he starch heavy. And they're also uh, come from poor sources. So um, in here, I, I say to eliminate starch and to eliminate glyphosate. And the only way to really do that completely is to eliminate extruded feed. So uh, it's really important that uh, you're not creating other deficiencies by taking that extruded feed out um, and not replacing it with something else. So it's really important to uh, do a diet analysis with a professional and also a mineral and vitamin blood test. If you, if your horse has really poor feet, it's really important to test for, uh, vitamin A, vitamin E, um, and also B vitamins. And if they have low B vitamins, that can be a sign that their gut is having a hard time because most of the B vitamins should be coming from their gut bacteria. Um, there's also a full mineral panel that you can do, uh, which includes like all the, the macro and micro minerals. You can get that tested to see if there's anything low there. Um, a lot of horses are dealing with low calcium, which is like, if your horse has low calcium, you're going to have feet problems for sure. A lot of horses are very low in vitamin E as well. And we know for hair and nails for humans, Vitamin E is extremely important and it's no different for horses because their feet are made of the same thing as our hair and our nails. Um, so yes, mineral and vitamin blood testing, uh, calcium phosphorus ratio balance, vitamin A, B, and E, you can test for all of those. Um, it's fairly inexpensive compared to trying to throw things at whatever in the dark and not really knowing, um, at least if everything looks good, then you can rule it out and you can keep exploring as to why your horse might be having problems. Um, diet analysis with a professional, like I said, uh, focus on forage and fiber versus trying to balance everything through an extruded feed um, because of the inflammatory factors and, uh, that can come with using processed feeds. Um, protein is another one that is like so under, underrated. Um, so many horses have protein deficiencies. And usually you can see this directly by um, what the horse actually looks like, how their muscling looks. Um, you can tell so much by looking at their body condition uh, as to whether or not they're having a protein deficiency and some sort of amino acid deficiency. Um, and then, yeah, eliminating extruded feed, eliminating starch, and then I can't see it, but I'm pretty sure it says eliminate glyphosate here at the bottom. So <laughs> um, glyphosate is a, if you don't know what glyphosate is by now, 
Um, it is a, uh, it's otherwise known as Roundup. It's an herbicide, uh, but it's also a patented antibiotic. And it also has been proven to be an endocrine disruptor. So it, it can contribute not only to metabolic disease, um, but also to um, hoof disease, laminitis, uh, insulin resistance, all of these things that we're seeing in uh, way too many times in horses these days, especially as they get older. So you may not notice you know, any side effects when they're younger if they're on extruded feed, which is where you'll primarily find glyphosate um, because glyphosate exists in wheat, corn, canola, um, even flax is being sprayed with it now, um, soy, alfalfa, all of these, uh, you know, uh, industrialized um, agriculture um, crops are all being heavily genetically modified to handle large amounts of glyphosate and also other types of um, lesser known herbicides that also have those same um, health risks associated with them. So it's really important to try and eliminate um, feeding herbicides to your horse because I think they're a lot more sensitive to sugar and starch and glyphosate than we have um, recent or previously thought, um, especially when we look at, you know, what diseases horses are suffering from. So uh, in particular with feet, um, glyphosate is, uh, there's a great video from a doctor uh, who's a researcher for the California Protect Environmental Protection Agency. His name is Dr. Anthony Samsel, and he works in California. And um, I sent Steph a video link to check out his video. It's about 10 minutes of him talking about his research on um how he tracked glyphosate from the feed of a bunch of a group of horses and he tracked it into every single tissue um, in the horse. So I'm talking about the brain, I'm talking about the feet, I'm talking about urine, muscle tissue, every tissue in the body. Um, and he particularly talks about um, how most of these horses feet with a certain level uh, are having like feet that are literally like falling apart. So, um, you know, you could potentially be doing everything right and your horse is having really terrible hoof problems. Um, you really wanna take a look at uh, reducing glyphosate. So I think Steph will put that in the chat for us and you can take a look at that further if you like. Um, so sorry, I grabbed this from another slide. So sorry for the, the totally different slide here. Um, nutrients for hoof health. Uh, like I said, calcium is a really underrated one. A lot of horses are not getting enough calcium. And um, if the calcium and phosphorus ratio is not correct, it can not only affect the feet, but it can also affect uh, the joints, the bones, and also the nervous system. So we see a lot of horses with neurological disease, chronic sports injuries, um, chronically terrible feet. All these things are, are we, you would want to rule out a calcium deficiency in those cases. Uh, vitamin A, beta carotene comes from lots of plant-based sources. Um, it's, it's fairly hard to have a vitamin A deficiency, but it does occur sometimes. So you wanna make sure that your horse is having access to uh, that nutrient for their feet. Uh, B vitamins and especially vitamin B7, which is biotin. So you've probably heard of that for feet before. It's very, very common um, for horses to have biotin deficiency. And um, if they have deficiencies in other B vitamins, the B vitamins all work synergistically together. So by increasing only one of them, you may not actually be covering your bases. So you always wanna make sure that your all the B vitamins are being given so that if there is a deficiency and you're adding say biotin, that um, there are all the other B vitamins there to support the addition of that 
biotin because otherwise um, it's not gonna get used correctly and you may not see any results. Um, microminerals, especially the iron, zinc, and copper ratio. So a lot of people I've talked to uh, all over Canada, actually, from the West Coast to the East Coast are telling me that they have very, if we're on a well, oftentimes we have very high iron water. So um, to counter this, uh, we have to make sure that we're adding some zinc and copper in to balance out the iron zinc and copper ratio, because if the iron is too high and zinc and copper is too low, um, it can affect how the hoof grows and also many other issues, um, including metabolic disease. <laughs> uh, fiber is another one that I really, really support people giving as many different fiber sources as you possibly can, because fiber comes in so many forms from so many different types of plants. Um, from forage, uh, a lot of horses are just eating one type of forage, uh, whereas in nature, they'd be eating tons and tons of different varieties. They'd be eating herbs and all different types of plants and bark and, you know, leaves and all kinds of things. So um, we want to try and diversify and give as many different types of fiber and prebiotics is really what they are um, to support uh, you know, the, the microbiome to be as healthy as humanly possible. The more diverse your fiber sources, the more diverse your microbiome, the healthier your horse is gonna be. So that's what you're always aiming for is like a really diverse microbiome, which you can do with food. Um, and if you're, if you're focusing on that, the gut is so connected to that systemic inflammation, systemic circulatory issues, um, that you know, even that one thing, just looking at their diet really closely uh, and eliminating starch and increasing the fiber, oftentimes this can make a big difference. And then omega-3s, a lot of horses are very low in omega-3s. Um, I do not recommend feeding fish oil to horses. So uh, plant-based sources are my favorite. They work really well with horses. Um, I see lots of good results with only plant-based. Um, I know there's a lot of argument about, um, you know, that horses need DHA and EPA, uh, which it probably does reduce inflammation, but the uh, sustainability factor of fish oil, uh, plus the heavy metal content, plus the fact that a lot of times it's often gone rancid. Um, I actually use freshly ground flax and um, chia, organic chia seeds. And um, I soak the chia ahead of time, so it's highly digestible. Um, this also adds really important amino acids to their diet. Um, it also adds mucilage to their diet and all these other healthy fibers, prebiotics. So the more, again, the more types of prebiotics you can add, um, this is really gonna make a big difference. Uh, talk to your farrier. Like I said, pre-book your farrier appointments, ask questions. If something looks weird or you notice something, um, farriers are so busy, they're like falling apart because there's not enough of them. So they might miss something. It's your horse. And if you see something that looks weird, looks different, um, doesn't look right to you, just mention it to your farrier and ask them about it. Cause um, you know, I'm sure that uh, they'd be happy to answer all your questions. Um, and then uh, always, you know, assessing, is your horse in pain? Uh, you know, what is their normal? And then once you know what their normal is, if it's not normal, um, you know, you can give either, and, and or your veterinarian and your farrier a call. Um, solutions, uh, topical solutions for, for feet. So there's a million different topical things. And I kind of shamelessly put a, uh, advertisement of some of, uh, products that I use and, uh, make, um, and, uh, I always eliminate. So there are a lot of hoof products on the market that contain formaldehyde. Um, and creosote and highly caustic ingredients 
that are, um, you're not even supposed to touch them with your own hands. Um, and they do get absorbed into the foot and into the bloodstream. So I always try to remove caustic hoof products from your hoof care routine. Um, you know, if there's a serious, serious issue going on where you have to harden the hooves in, in an emergency fashion, um, or uh, if you've got a really serious and deep uh, infection going on, of course, short term, some of these things can be very useful. Um, but on a regular basis, you want to try and eliminate those things and um, add in uh, topical like hoof oils and um, balms that are actually nourishing the hoof and supporting it for the environment that it's existing in. So when it's really hot and dry, uh, you would want to use oils. Uh, but if it's really, really damp, then you want to kind of forego the oils. Um, I use a, uh, a balm that has beeswax in it and then also has all those really high quality oils but they don't seep into the foot because of the beeswax. So, um, and the beeswax actually forms a um, waterproof layer on the foot. So it doesn't get so um, inundated with, with standing in a wet environment all the time. So it can harden the hooves even when it's really wet. Um, and gut health, like I said, <laughs> um, regular access to healthy microbes. Um, dirt is, is primarily where horses would do that in nature, um, but we don't always, they don't always have access to that. So that's why I do recommend, even if you can hand graze your horse, um, that will give them access to some of those microbes that are living in the ground. Um, and then if you can't do that, then uh, a good, really good quality probiotics are, are a must. So that's really, really, and then uh, rotating your probiotics as well. So you can um, either take breaks from them um, or you can rotate to different strains as well. Um, and then why a wide range of low starch fibers, prebiotics, which will help to promote those types of bacteria that are going to, to um, help reduce inflammation by creating short chain fatty acids, which is a, a systemic um, anti-inflammatory reduction uh, that the immune system will take advantage of if they're available. Um, and your probiotic or your happy gut is is where primarily those um, are created. So it's really important that those bacteria exist in the gut so that they can create those, those anti-inflammatory effects. And then stress assessment, um, cortisol uh, has been shown to be a, a contributor to gut health and ulcers and colic and all of these awful gut diseases, um, which can in turn affect the feet. So very important to make sure that your horse is living as stress-free a life as possible. And you can always do that with your trainer, um, a horse behaviorist, um, and also using your intuition, like is your horse, you know, be, be honest and make sure that there's nothing that's really stressing your horse out on a daily basis. Uh, yeah, and then gut healing nutraceuticals. We kind of talked about omega-3s already. The types that I generally use for horses, uh, flax, camelina, algae, um, and I also use chia. They all contain omega-3s. Um, algae oil does have EPA and DHA, so I usually will rotate that one in because it's a little more expensive than some of the other types. Um, and it's good to have different sources as well. So I go through all of these sources. Um, probiotics, like I said, really high quality strains, uh, really high quality prebiotics to support it. Um, and it will literally help support every single system in the body. And then N-acetylglucosamine is a plant-derived, well, you can get it plant-derived, ours is plant-derived. Uh, which will help to support those interstitial linings. So every interstitial lining, so blood vessels, um, gut lining, bladder, lungs, um, all the blood vessels in the entire body 
um, which includes in the legs and the feet. Uh, it's a wonderful way to reduce inflammation in a very quick fashion. So very, very useful and very um, easy to find and uh, not very expensive. And then L-glutamine is another one. Uh, it's a amino acid, but it's very important for gut lining repair. And um, that's a really big uh, help if your horse is having um, you know, either suspected ulcers or has been scoped and diagnosed with ulcers and or has had um, colic uh, episodes in the past or chronic colic. And then this is my one of my little success stories. <laughs> um, this is Roman. He was, I believe he was five when um, this first picture was taken. And you can see he has a number of these problems that we've been talking about. Um, he has a serious problem with his hoop integrity. His, his feet are actually pancaking into the ground because just from the weight of his body. Um, and this is not necessarily a farrier issue. Um, this was a nutritionally um, nutritional issue with this horse. So you can also see he has rings um, growth rings in his feet, and he also has toe cracks. So all of these things were really indicative of a number of nutritional deficiencies. He was going lame quite regularly. He was very sore. You can see the angles of his feet are very poor. Um, and this is not the farrier's fault. This was because of the way that the feet were growing. So very important to address all of these concerns um, through food. And we literally did it just with food. So we changed his diet. We got him off the extruded feed. We increased and diversified his fiber. Um, we added some organic selenium, zinc, um, vitamin E, and uh, made sure his calcium phosphorus was balanced. Um, and uh, I believe the second picture was taken, yeah, a year, not even a year later, six months later. So that's only, you know, uh, I'm gonna call that like six trimmings, six shoeings, and look at the difference. It's crazy. So <laughs> this is like, this is why I rant and rave about diet all the time because it really does make such a huge difference. Um, and, and, you know, you can make such progress in such a short amount of time if you, you just, you know, do the basics, very basic things. Um, so that, that was a really nice story and that horse is still doing very well. And um, it's, uh, what are we at, 2023? Yeah, he's still going strong, he's doing great. So that is everything that I have. Um, I did wanna leave some time for questions. I don't know what time it is. Woo, we've been talking for a while. <laughs> I tried to go fast. Oh, it's a great presentation, <laughs> Sarah. Questions? We can probably take a few. Hey, awesome. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Lorraine had a question about the hoof balm uh, that you recommended. Would you would you use that in the winter? Yeah, I use it when it's um, wet. So it can be used in the winter. Uh, here in the fall, it's really rainy, and our our spring is also really rainy. So I use the balm often in the winter time and then once it gets really dry and hard in the summer there's more um there's more risk of you know cracking and and that sort of issue so you do want to moisturize and nourish the feet a little bit so then i would switch to an oil um, that doesn't have uh, that waterproofing factor to it and then that's how i would topically deal with it if you're having um real integrity issues and um, bacterial issues and things that are going really deep into the foot, it's probably more likely an internal issue um, that isn't gonna be solved just by topical things. And I just have to say that, um, but uh, the topicals can be extremely useful for um, you know healthy feet and maintenance on a regular basis. in the picture that's him in the field uh linda's got a question it's a little bit long so bear with me here um although sarah may address it during the talk if we're feeding our horses organic dried herbs 
Can you talk about the max dosage when we are combining several herbs at the same time? Or should we use several herbs or should we even use several herbs at the same time? For example, my horse is on oprazole for ulcers. So I am giving her herbs to help support her digestive tract and giving slippery elm, dandelion root, marshmallow root, chamomile, and peppermint. Mm -hmm. Should I give just a teaspoon or two of each or am I wasting my money? To continue, although my horse is on omeprazole, mm -hmm. it's not it's not sure that she has ulcers. We just ruled out Lyme, PSSM, and now trying to see if it's ulcer related. She's very reactive to ulcer population points, pal mm -hmm. palpitation points. Yeah. Due to your blogs, I've gone, I've got her on non-GMO beet pulp and I'm introducing the natural herbs. Her feet are fantastic. She doesn't have a stressful environment. She was low on selenium. Okay. Um... I'm going to go have a peek in the store while you answer that and see if there's something that we might be able to help everyone here with. Sure. So, yeah. So, um, ulcers are, we do have a, uh, a whole entire YouTube, uh, previous, um, talk that I did on, uh, leaky gut and we go through basically all of the things that can take care of, um, so ulcers are a, I call them an end stage verse, ver, uh, thing that happens when a horse has leaky gut. So leaky gut can just be really bad systemic inflammation in the gut that leads to later on these holes um, in the tissue. And then they can go from grade one, which is still to me quite severe, um, but can go up to a grade four, which is like, whoa, really bad. So um, with, uh, with herbs, all of the herbs that you um, put her on are all awesome. Um, they do all have specific uses, uh, particularly with um, uh, gut issues. I find um, what I generally start with is I do two herbs rather than a whole bunch of them. And then I, uh, load them on two and then I leave them on those two for about two months and see how they're doing. So normally what I do with herbs is I, I do about one third of a cup total of dried herb. Um, at a time. So you can do that per day or you can split it into two. I like to do it once a day. Um, so I, I really like slippery elm. Marshmallow root is really nice and cheap as well. So it's, it's a nice one to use. You can use more of it because of that. Um, and um, L-glutamine, like I said, is a, a great nutraceutical that you can also use that helps to um, turn over the gut lining um, quicker. It also helps to um, bring back the mucosal lining, which can be an issue. Uh, that's why your horse is on omeprazole because that reduces stomach acid, which helps um, to reduce the erosion if there's a hole in the tissue. So it gives the tissue a break from being bathed in acid all the time. Unfortunately, the side effect of that is that um, it reduces digestion. So horses are supposed to have a lot of acid in their stomach um, and in their intestine, in their small intestine. So if they don't have that, there is a risk if you're using omeprazole for long-term treatment um, that they will have, uh, there's a higher risk of impaction colic uh, which is um, because they can't actually break down the fibers in their food. So um, if you're using omeprazole, I usually, if it depends on how long they're going to have to be on it. If it's just a month, that's fine. Um, if, you, if you're doing it longer than that, I would recommend to be adding more moisture into the diet <clears throat> to make sure that they're able to break down their food correctly because their stomach acid and the water that is output by that as well is, is reduced. So it does affect how
how they can digest their food. Um, but I would start with probably two of those five herbs. If you have, if you have started them already, you can always adjust it. Um, and we also have a product called Equine Gut Soothe, which has all like almost all of those herbs, plus it has aloe vera, plus it has L-glutamine, um, and acetylglucosamine, and then it has an equine strain of probiotics. Um, it has 15 different strains of probiotics in it. So um, I just got some feedback from a friend of mine. She uh, has a horse that was on the gut soothe last year, and she um, uh, she put her on it because she had colic mildly about six times in three months, um, which is crazy. And she's a five-year-old horse, so not very old. And um, she took her off of the gut soothe uh, because she was doing well. Um, and then uh, six months went by and uh, she's had four or five colic episodes in the last month. Hmm. So she put her back on the gut soothe um, and we're waiting to see what's gonna happen, but she was literally fine for six months uh, while she was on it and then started having issues. So we're now looking at her environment, where she's living, do we have to move her? You know, What do we have to do to, to make this horse a little bit healthier and happier? Um, it's always more disturbing when they're younger. So I always get stressed out when they're young and they're having those issues already. Um, so I think, yeah, if you want to start with two, marshmallow root is where I usually start. It's, it's awesome for um, increasing the mucosa, uh, protecting against that acid buildup. Um, and then slippery elm is another one that's really, really good for that. So I would probably start with a few and just give more of those two and then establish what's happening and then rotate in a third one, a fourth one. And oftentimes I use only two to three herbs at a time. I use them for two months and then I switch them up. And by doing that, I'm increasing their access to different types of fiber, different types of prebiotics. Um, but you do want to make sure that you're using probiotics as well um, to, uh, you know, if there is a bacterial issue going on, you, you actually have to replace and try and get the microbiome to change. So you, oftentimes probiotics are, are needed to make that change along with those herbs. Thanks, Sarah. Answered your question. Definitely. <laughs> long-winded question or a long-winded answer. <laughs> yeah, she wrote here, thank you for the great info. Sounds wonderful. Uh, this particular horse has never colicked, thankfully. And for everyone that's here live, uh, code equine 21 word will save you 20% on equine specific adored beast products. Uh, just add the coupon when you check out. Sarah, there's a question here also from Sarah on Facebook. What can I do to help a horse recently diagnosed with navicular? Hmm. She's fed a hay diet turned out 24 seven is fed gut soothe and jump for joints. Gut soothe and jump for joints. Okay. Um, I'm going to assume that this horse is a little on the older side, maybe we'll see if she chats with us there. Um, she's on Facebook, so there might be a bit of a lag. Yeah. So, um, that would be something that I would, uh, probably because it's a inflat it has an inflammatory aspect to it. I would make sure she's getting enough omega threes. Um, you can also increase the gut soothe to um, a therapeutic dose, which we don't put on the label or a therapeutic serving, I should say. Um, and that would be double the amount that's uh, recommended for the size of your horse. So most horses are around a thousand pounds. So I think it's about a tablespoon or one scoop. Um, so you can actually double that for uh, four to six weeks. And um, this can help to reduce systemic inflammation by supporting the gut and um, giving it a, a double 
access to that and it's totally safe to do that. You just don't wanna do it for long periods of time, but it, you can think of it as a therapeutic kind of loading dose and then you can go back down. You can always see what that looks like, how your horse is feeling, how your horse is looking. And then as you go back down to the maintenance dose, see how they're doing in that regard. And I actually fluctuate up and down with mine, depending on, you know, the season, like when they're shedding their coats and things like that, I always increase it. I also put them on the liver tonic at those times of the year, uh, which is our, it's a liquid herbal um, extract that we do. And um, jump for joints, I don't know how often you're using it. I think it says to use it once or twice a day on the bottle. You can always increase that. Um, if you're using it long-term over two weeks, you wanna make sure that you succuss the bottle, which is banging the bottle on your hand five, around five times. And this just slightly changes the potency of the homeopathic remedies that are in the bottle. Um, and this actually helps to, for it to work better. And then um, make sure that you're not gonna have any homeopathic aggravations, which is very extremely rare. But um, if, you're, if you're using it long-term, it is a good idea to do that. So um, you can go, like if a horse is, is visibly lame, um, or, or, you know, when he has a, or when she has a, a visit with the vet, if you're flexing and you're doing all those things and, and they are showing up lame, you can use the remedy up to five times a day for short periods of time. So um, to, to reduce that inflammation and make them more comfortable. So um, you could try doing it five times or four times a day for seven days see what your horse is feeling like at the end of that seven days. And that's the nice thing about homeopathy is you literally can't overdose with it. So you can play around with it and see like how your horse is doing on different um, repetitions and, um, you know, different, uh, you know, if you're doing it more often, like every, I guess it would be like every three to three hours if you were doing it five times a day versus having it done every 12 hours if you're doing it twice a day. So um, I always play around with remedies like that because every horse is a little bit different. And um, yeah, omega-3s make a big difference for um, joint and ligament inflammation. And then just maybe checking in and um, doing like a mineral blood panel, which isn't very expensive. So next time your vet's out, um, you might ask them to pull some blood and just make sure there's no nutritional deficiencies going on. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, the horse is 21. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Usually when those things start to show up. <laughs> one more quickie here from Lorene. She's starting to think that um, the low, I'm starting to think the low heel problem I've been having may be nutritional. Sarah says, thank you. Mm -hmm. Everything else seems great, including good hoof integrity and general health. One of my horses has had two bouts of thrush this year, though. Never had it before in her entire 24 years, though the weather's been so wildly different from wet to dry. Both mm. of them are not growing a lot of heel, though. Right. Yes. So, um, yeah, this year has been particularly extreme in a lot of places. Um, and thrush is an opportunistic bacteria, uh, or a number of different bacteria. So as horses get older, they can become more susceptible to infections like that. Um, so make sure your farrier is coming really regularly to come and trim any tissues off that are really affected. And then um, internally, uh, I would probably be using the jump for joints uh, because it's so amazing at um, reaching these, these types of tissues and reducing inflammation and uh, also uh, increasing circulation. So um, that's one of the main things that you can do for thrush issues and chronic thrush is increasing the inf or the um, circulation and the oxygen to the feet. So um, sometimes that involves pulling shoes off if they have shoes on to increase the ability of the 
horse's hoof to flex. Um, lots of like gentle hand walking. Um, and uh, some people have told me that they've used uh, laser, like cold laser and even some hot laser to just increase the circulation in their legs and their feet. Um, that can really help to reduce or, or increase oxygen. Anytime you're increasing oxygen to the feet, you're, you're reducing thrush's ability to live in that setting. So that's, that's one of the biggest um, important factors with um, thrush. And then also like topically, um, I actually use a lot of aromatherapy. Um, and if you're in the States, um, you could contact Animal EO uh, who have like a huge number of um, uh, aromatherapy uh, concoctions for uh, specifically for horses and um, you can use them topically. Some of them are topical for their feet. Um, my, com my other company <laughs> makes a aromatherapy um, hoof oil that can be used for the same thing. And I also use it as a preventative treatment on my horses as well. And it's, it doesn't have any um, antibiotics in it, but um, the aromatherapy oils like tea tree oil, clove oil, um, uh, lemon peel. Uh, what else is in there? There's six different ones in there. But anyway, there's a whole bunch of them that um, are, are antibacterial that can really help if, you, if you're dealing with a topical issue. If it's really deep and there's lots of deep grooves in the foot that are really infected, um, there is a chance that, you know, you might have to use something a little more nasty than that. Um, can I put jumper joints in her food? She won't let me give it to her directly. Yeah, um, usually what, uh, if, if horses are not into just having it squirted in their mouths, I usually just pour out a piece of apple and I just stick it in the apple and I just feed them the apple. And that's right. like, just so that they're not, you know, you know that they're getting it and it's dispersing in their mouth with just a tiny amount of food. And one more thing quick, would the adored beast colloidal silver saw be something that could be used for thrush? Totally. A million billion percent. Yeah. Awesome. That's it. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you for your questions. Um, yeah. They're always, always, I always learn something on these equine events. That's for sure. And All right, I everyone. We'll be recording where this is recorded. So people will be able to view it later yeah. on as well. On our Definitely. YouTube. I'll put it up on YouTube tomorrow or the next day, and I will let everyone know when the next event is scheduled for, and we'll get everyone registered and see you in a few weeks. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, you guys. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye.